Right, so you want to know how to build a proper Zigbee network that actually works reliably? Or maybe you're doing battle with your current existing mesh network. Either way, you're in the right place because today we're going to cover everything from the absolute basics, like why your coordinator placement matters, all the way through to enumerating errors in your logs. We'll talk coordinators, routers versus end devices, channel selection, interference, and yes, we'll even dive into log files, which often people tend to ignore, but they play a key role in diagnosing issues and building a rock solid setup. So as the video goes on, topics are gonna get progressively more advanced. Let's dive straight into the foundation, your coordinator. Now, I can't stress this enough. The coordinator is basically the brain of your entire Zigbee network. Pick a rubbish one and you're gonna be fighting connectivity issues for months. Pick a good one and everything just works. Well, kind of, we'll get into that. So when it comes to choosing a coordinator, do your research, and I mean properly research it. Don't just grab the first USB stick you find on Amazon because it's cheap. Read reviews, check compatibility, look at the community forums. The few extra pounds that you spend here is gonna save you weeks of frustration later. What I'm using right now is the SLZB06M. I'll pop a link down in the description for that. It's actually not a USB stick. It's a power over ethernet uh, coordinator and I absolutely love it. I would highly recommend them. It's been absolutely rock solid for me and the range is fantastic, but here's the thing. Even if you've got the best coordinator in the world, placement matters more than you might think. We'll cover that a little bit more later on in the video. If you're using a USB coordinator and there's lots of people out there who are, you absolutely need to use a USB extension cable. Why? Because USB 3 ports can cause electromagnetic interference through your Zigbee channel. This isn't some theoretical problem either, it's actually real. There's a really good video that was demonstrated by the people at Nabucasa who show that moving USB cable closer to a coordinator actually stops it from working. This is the sort of thing that will drive you absolutely mad trying to figure out why your devices keep on dropping offline and it's gonna be very erratic and difficult to troubleshoot. So definitely make sure that you're using a shielded extension cable. A simple extension cable costs next to nothing and it can literally save your entire network. Get the coordinator away from your computer and away from any USB 3 ports and ideally somewhere central in your home. Think about your home's layout where are the devices actually going to be and what's gonna be between them. A central location on the ground floor might not help much if half of your devices are upstairs. In the middle of your house is surrounded by solid walls, then consider that 2.4 gigahertz signals might not travel through them particularly well. Now here's something that catches a lot of people out. Connecting directly to your coordinator might seem fast and like a good idea, but be aware there is a device limit on coordinators. You should check the documentation exactly for what the device limit is on your coordinator. This is generally okay when you're just starting out in your Zigbee network and you've got a handful of devices on them, but if you get the bug and you end up with 80 devices on your network, you'll start to see problems. What you're ultimately aiming for is a mesh network. Right, let's talk about something that will save you massive headaches if you get it right from the start, which is channel selection. Zigbee works on 2.4 gigahertz, which is the same frequency as your Wi-Fi, your microwave, and half the electronics in your house. The key is finding the channel that doesn't clash with everything else. Use an app like Wi-Fi Analyzer, again, there's a link down in the description, to check what channels your surrounding 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi are using. You want to pick a Zigbee channel that's far away from busy Wi-Fi channel as possible. Here's the critical bit, make the decision at the start. If you Change your Zigbee channel later, you'll have to repair every single device in your network. And trust me, you don't want to have to do that with 50 plus devices. Now let's get into the nitty gritty of how the network actually works. You've got three types of devices. You've got your coordinator, which we've covered, and you've also got routers and end devices. Understanding the difference is crucial for a reliable network. Routers are typically devices that have constant power. So your smart plugs, your light switches, your smart bulbs. Um, be careful though, because not all powered devices are routers. You should definitely check the documentation for that. And it's, it's a dangerous assumption to make that all powered devices will be routers. Some manufacturers make mains powered devices that only act as end devices, which is pretty useless for building a strong mesh network. I got caught out here by buying some of the Akara H1 light switches, assuming that they would work as routers. 
End devices are your battery powered sensors like motion sensors, door sensors, temperature sensors, that kind of stuff. These little guys don't route traffic like other devices. They just connect to your network and send their data, but they won't route packets through them to other devices. Typically devices can connect to any router in range. Some bit can be quite picky about which routers they connect to though. Um, if you try and pair your device in their final position, that tends to help with the routing. Don't pair them next to your coordinator and then move them across the house. They'll try and maintain the original connection, even if there's a better route nearby. Now, the mesh itself is where Zigbee gets really clever. Zigbee devices form their mesh automatically. It sounds great in theory. There's something that most people don't realize though. It takes time. And I'm not just talking hours or even days, but some Zigbee networks can take weeks to establish themselves so that they're fully optimized. Um, this is probably the hardest part for most people because everyone wants things to work perfectly right away, but your devices are constantly learning about each other and figuring out the best routes and adapting to changes in their environment. So patience is absolutely key here. Something that may well save you hours of troubleshooting is knowing that some devices are what I call sticky. So Akara devices are notorious for this. They latch onto the first router they connect to and they'll refuse to jump to a better router, even if the signal strength is terrible. That's why pairing in the final position for these kind of devices is especially important. Don't overload routers either. They have limits on how many devices they can handle typically. The good news is you can actually pair end devices with specific routers if you know what you're doing. I use Zigbee to MQTT and there's an option to open up pairing on the network for specific devices. So I highly encourage trying that out. Okay, this is what separates the beginners from the advanced users is deep diving into log files. Most people will tend to ignore their logs, but the logs are basically telling you a story about what's happening on your network. And trust me, once you know how to read them, troubleshooting becomes so much more easy. Okay, so here we have the entire database with all of the Zigbee devices in. We've got the configuration, which will basically give us a mapping of those Zigbee devices over to a friendly name. And we have the log file, which is where all of the fun things are happening. So if we look at the root error many to one failures, and we look at this as an example of one of the things that's going wrong, you can see it happens quite a lot throughout the logs. And this is one of the things that we want to dive into, but there is all of these log file instances. We don't really want to go through and manually figure out how often this is happening. So what we're gonna do is take the log file and we're going to use the ID that we get from here. And we're gonna figure out from here what that ID is and that will tell us it's this particular manufacturing device or device with this manufacturing name. It's gonna give us an IEEE address and then we can use that IEEE address to look up in here what the friendly name is. So you can see here, it's the Snug LED Vance socket. So we can map this error, which happens a lot for this particular ID all the way back to the snug LED runs socket. So I don't want to do that manually. So I'm gonna use my friend Claude. Um, and here's one I made earlier. What I've done is I've uploaded a bunch of some of the old log files and the old configurations. So you can see a before and after. And I've taken basically this prompt and I've said using the old logs, the old configurations and the old database, find this particular error and various other errors and then go through and basically do all of that mapping so we can figure out what it looks like. It's going to go through and do its magic um, and we're basically going to get this artifact and it's going to tell us um, what the friendly name is, the IEEE address and basically the errors and uh, how critical those errors are, how often they're occurring in the logs and stuff like that. So. You, you can leverage this quite easily to figure out what's going on with your network. Um, I also used, if I go back to my network, the newer version after I'd basically gone through and fixed a bunch of my issues and I ran the same analysis and basically got a similar result. But you can see here the numbers are much lower. There's uh, basically only some very, very low severity errors. 
Some of them are actually due to things like configuration timeouts and crawl is going to be very useful here and basically tell me that this is um, this is basically not much of an issue. It's a fairly transient issue that happens during startup. And it's going to tell me a few recommendations and in conclusion, the cleanup was highly successful. Brilliant. So I'm still going to use the logs and I'm going to look through the logs to get some hints on what I might be looking for. And then I'm just going to use AI to help me enumerate those instances and figure out what needs to happen next. Look, building a reliable Zigbee network isn't rocket science, but it does require a bit of patience and understanding on how these devices actually work together. Start with a coordinator, choose your channels carefully, understand the difference between routers and end devices, and most importantly, learn to read your logs. Do this right and you'll have a great network that's incredibly reliable, responsive, and just works. Get it wrong and you'll be constantly fighting connectivity issues and wondering why your smart home feels like a dumb home. If this video helped you out, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more smart home content. Check out the description for all the links I mentioned and leave a comment down below. What's your biggest Zigbee challenge? Did I cover everything? Do you think I missed anything? Let me know. I read every comment and I often turn them into future videos, so don't be shy. Until next time, happy automating, and I'll catch you in the next one.